Okay, good morning and thank you for being with us today. I am Emily Moses, the Executive Staff Advisor for the Kentucky Arts Council. And I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement recognizing the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Today, we are on the land once occupied by ancient peoples whose history has been lost, but whose legacy remains. The evidence of these ancient people can be seen all over Kentucky through the mounds and artifacts left behind. In Frankfort, Kentucky, where I am today, we occupy the lands of the Cherokee East, the Osage, the Yuchi, the Shawnee, the Hopewell culture, and the Adena culture. Today, more than 170 American Indian tribes are represented by their members living and working in the Commonwealth. We honor those who were here and those who are here and build together on their legacy of stewardship. We are thrilled that you are with us today. There is a great need in communities across the country to address the multitude of issues around emergencies and disasters that affect the arts field. The Kentucky Arts Council became involved in this work following the historic and catastrophic long track tornadoes that left in their path expansive devastation in Western Kentucky on the night of December 10th, 2021. Seven months later, on July 27th, and in the days following, historic and mass flooding in the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky caused massive devastation in the region, again, with significant repercussions for the arts community. In both instances, arts organizations were completely destroyed or experienced significant damage to physical structures, archives, collections, and artwork, all gone in an instant. The lives and livelihoods of hundreds of artists were affected by lost property, homes, studios, lost equipment, supplies, finished work, works in progress, and notwithstanding, communities that stood proud one day were gone the next. This is the third in our series of conversations with those in the arts field who work in the area of examining, preparing for, and responding to emergencies and disasters in our sector. It is indisputable that data makes a difference in advancing support for the arts at the local, state, and national levels. We've seen evidence of this through creative economy studies that opened doors for the arts across the country and initiated partnerships and conversations in ways they had not before. There is currently not comprehensive national data around disasters and emergencies in the arts. And this edition of our series explores the ideas of research and data around these topics. I'm excited to introduce you to University of Kentucky researcher and instructor of arts emergency management, Leah Hamilton, and Lauren Hainley, former emergency and disaster response director for the Houston Arts Alliance. Leah and Lauren are going to share their experiences and expertise with us about collecting data and reporting and how they connect to improvements in the sector. They'll share examples of how we might move forward in the field of arts emergency, readiness, response, and recovery. So we're going to start with hearing from Lauren Hainley today. Lauren, tell us about yourself and the Houston Area Arts Alliance. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Lauren Hainley, as she said, I'm a former director of disaster services at the Houston Arts Alliance. The Houston Arts Alliance is the local arts agency for the city of Houston. The majority of the work that that uh, HAA does is in partnership with the city of Houston. We give out grants and we uh, or they manage the um, uh, the civic art collection for the city of Houston. Uh, what the Arts uh, Alliance also does is private um, projects as asked for by the arts community. And that is where the disaster services program came from. It's a privately funded program within um, the, the overarching, um, you know, uh, it, 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 within the organization. Um, we, uh, you may have heard of it, but there was a very small hurricane in 2018 called Harvey. Um, it didn't really make the news, didn't do a lot of like national coverage, but it did put 52 inches of water on top of our uh, city, which is the fourth largest city in the world. Not the world, the country. <laughs> um, so it was a it was a bit of a disaster billions of dollars of damage and as a result of that the arts community came together and said you know what are we going to do we have to do something 
right? You know, we were looking at pictures of our theater district, the main, you know, theater district of our city, just like underwater, completely underwater. And we were thinking to ourselves, if these major institutions are flooded, what about the small ones? What about the individual artists? What about the medium sized organizations? Do they even know where to start? So those organizations, those service organizations, including HAA, came together and created what was called the Harvey Arts Recovery Fund. And the Harvey Arts Recovery Fund gave away something around $250,000 to small to mid-sized arts organizations and individual artists in Harris County, which is the county Houston is in, and eight surrounding counties, which was where um, some of the devastation of Harvey was really bad. Um, and when that was done, when they exhausted those funds, they said to themselves, how can we be sure this doesn't happen again? Like, what do we do to create a system that makes this not happen again? So HAA was tasked with the goal of figuring that out. And um, so we, embark we embarked on a three year research study that um, gave us some answers. And um, uh, we'll talk about that, you know, as the presentation goes on. Um, as a result of that work, we've been able to respond to COVID. Um, we had a major ice storm here in Houston um, in 2021. Um, and then um, just last year, right around Christmas, we had a fire at an art studio in Houston that housed um, over 100 artists um, and just completely devastated. So um, we've been able to respond to all of those disasters based on the research that we did and what it has asked us to do. And I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Lauren, thank you so much. I'm so excited that you are here with us today and that everyone gets to meet you. <laughs> so thank you for being with us. And now Leah, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you would like to share uh, about the work that you do. Sure, thank you. Thanks Emily so much for putting together this series and giving um, a highlight to this topic. And um, I know I speak for many um, people in the room and, and myself to say that it's it's great to see us having these conversations more often. So thank you for your time putting this together. And yeah, I'm excited to be here with Lauren, who I respect deeply based on her work and the research. Well, I say research because she put out, I think one of the greatest reports um, about um, the arts and culture sector, particularly the arts and, and issues related to emergency and disaster preparedness. So just a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in the Ozarks in Southern Missouri. Um, and my background, while it is as a musician, um, I found that I enjoyed helping artists and arts thrive more through service than being on stage. So I started my arts career working at the Springfield Regional Arts Council, and we served, we, well, the Arts Council still serves 27 counties in Southwest Missouri. And while I was there, um, we ran a 25,000 square foot facility called the Creamery Arts Center. And of course, we experienced a number of emergency events there um, that I know many of you on this call are familiar with from you know, minor emergencies, pipes breaking, um, vandalism. Uh, we had close calls with violent threats and then of course sheltering events during severe weather. But when I was the executive director there, we also had two major events that, that for me um, kind of led me to doing research in this area. The first was the 2012 Joplin tornado the F5 um, that went through downtown Joplin, which is about 50 miles south of where I was based in Springfield. And then in 2014, a dear friend of mine was the manager of um, the White Theater in Overland Park, Kansas City, when there was an active shooter event that killed a couple of people, a grandfather and a son on their way to an audition there at the theater. What I witnessed and experienced really inspired me to pursue more to understand um, what preparedness actually means in the arts. As an arts manager, I felt like I had a lack of resources and training, even though I had um, a master's degree in arts management. And I felt that there needed to be more needed to be understood to help arts and cultural managers just know the process of protecting people and their organizations and their histories. So my first research project was a study of arts facilities in the state of Missouri in 2016. Um, and I found out two important things. Uh, one, that research in this area is very emotionally challenging. Um, 
because of the trauma of these events and, and having to relive the trauma of these events um, as someone who is a survivor and a participant in a study. And then on, on my end as a researcher, it's also emotionally challenging um, because I am also an artist. I'm quite empathetic and I, I feel like there's a veil that drops halfway through talking to people where I'm no longer a researcher. I'm just um, somebody who is maybe sharing tears or um, and just I'm not even thinking as an objective observer anymore. Um, I'm there with that person feeling for them. So it's it's really emotionally challenging and we'll talk about that more um, later in the in the in the hour. And the other thing uh, I found out is that um, it's difficult to make preparedness a management priority for most arts organizations. Um, naturally, the, this like the theoretical disaster that could happen, it's hard to dedicate time to plan for that when you have more pressing needs. Um, and usually that's day-to-day -day operations, fundraising, marketing. Um, and also what I, what I have found is that private nonprofit or whether you work for a public institution or you're a self-employed artist, you know, um, it's really how just figuring out how to prioritize it. That that is the difficulty. So um, in 2017, I started teaching for the University of Kentucky, and I um, the University Department of Arts Administration, the chair there, said, "Why do we not teach?" arts managers through our program about this topic. And I said, I don't know, but I would love to be teaching it. So I was hired and I've been teaching that um, course. It's a full semester course to uh, master's students in arts administration since 2017. It's actually a favorite course um, that the students say, uh, it, it's always well attended and they, they say, well, why aren't we talking about this more? So it's really an essential skill, and I hope over time we'll see that, that change. And just really, we'll go into this more. I'm truly honored to be um, leading some research right now on the disaster events that you opened, and, and we're talking about, Emily, the, the Western Kentucky tornado and the flooding in Eastern Kentucky. And we'll talk more about that survey, um, focus groups and interviews, and how that research is going um, here in just a little bit. So I'll kick it back to you, Emily. Thanks, Leah. Um, so um, I'm going to start with you. As a researcher, you are obviously well versed in the importance of the collection of data around preparedness response and other issues related to arts emergencies and disasters, as you just shared with us, your own experiences. Can you talk a little bit about why data and research is important in this subfield of the arts? Sure. Um... I, I think for me, one of the most important research, research or the reasons to have research, um, I, I'm a bit sensitive to it. I call myself a pracademic because anytime someone sees me as an academic, I feel like they automatically think, oh, the work that you do is not going to be helpful to the work we do as practitioners. And I understand why that, that, is, that feeling is there. And I, I like to call myself a pracademic because I really do feel like um, the research is specifically in arts and disasters it needs, we need to find this balance between our feelings and the reality. Um, already in the preliminary survey data from the Kentucky arts case study, what funders and supporters may feel is needed in the immediate aftermath to support artists and arts organizations may not actually be what is needed. For example, of the affected artists that have responded to the survey so far, a majority responded that they needed help with cleanup and then came replacing materials and cash. Um, knowing those things, are that's helpful, you know, for, for funders and supporters to know. So that's an important part of the research. And on the flip side, what artists and arts managers may feel is available to them might be less than what is actually available. For example, um, in the survey, what I'm seeing is a majority of responding artists didn't access artist support networks, um, groups that may be met on Zoom, um, from national to, to state networks, um, maybe, uh, and, and I need to dig more into the data, but possibly because they just didn't even know it existed. Uh, that seems to be the case. So um, this well-known security technologist, he's an author, he's an instructor, his name is Bruce Schneier. He's really into tech and security. He has this quote that I like, when our feelings match reality, we make better security trade-offs. So in other words, when we use data and our instincts, 
um, we are bound to make better decisions about our safety, about policy, and particularly in our area of arts and disaster, how we can better support as funders and agencies, artists and arts organizations before, during, and after disaster events. So I think it's important to not just have the data, but also on my end to look at our instincts. Um, what are some of the social behaviors that come about because of our traditions in specific areas, because of our beliefs? Um, I, I, being from the Ozarks, you know, generationally, I've been taught um, certain things to do from my father that I would not be taught anywhere else when it comes to tornado preparedness, for example. Um, so I think instincts um, are an important area too, just as, ma just as much as um, data. And one other thing that I, I, I want to mention is that, um, you know, in, in America and other developed countries, we have this very complex technological, we have these systems and these predictive models. Um, so think of like the Doppler radar using weather forecasting or sprinkler systems that we use to suppress fires. Um, they're designed to anticipate disaster situations and to help us save lives. However, a lot of research in social science around disasters repeatedly reveals that relying on these systems alone can give us a false sense of security or could possibly cause even more damage. So in a, in a particularly in a disaster event, there aren't enough public services, police, fire, healthcare workers to aid every person um, that needs it. There aren't enough fire marshals in a community to ensure that all of our arts facilities are up to code. So we have to take in the arts community, some responsibility for ourselves. Um, while first responders are on their way, I, I like to, to teach in my, my course anyway that the, the first responders in the arts are our organizations. They can be our docents, our volunteers, our ushers, um, our neighbors. So thinking about these local networks of support and trying to um, utilize them is sort of a, a different way of thinking. And instead of always relying on systems, um, especially governmental systems in particular, to always be there to help us out. Um, I think I'll go ahead and stop there, uh, and we can we can come back to other areas. Um, but I think that gives a, a good base, anyways. I think so there. too. Thank you so much for that, Leah, for that explanation. You really make the case there. And also, this is a perfect lead in to, uh, for Lauren to tell us about the report that the Arts Alliance did, um, the Disaster Resiliency and the Arts in the Houston Area Report. Lauren, can you tell us a little bit about why that was commissioned and what the purpose of the report was? Yeah, so <clears throat> like I said earlier, the report was a result of Hurricane Harvey. Um, we knew that we needed to, we learned a lot of lessons in responding to Hurricane Harvey and recovering from it, and we needed to find a way to sort of ensure that those lessons continued to be part of the, um, the culture of our culture, right, of our industry. Um, so we started with a, a steering committee of um, the five cultural districts, the, at that time five cultural districts in the city of Houston, as well as HAA and the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. Um, and I came in as the, the project director, the project manager. Um, this is where I enter the story. <laughs> so, um, you know, I looked around at that first steering committee and I said, I am surrounded by arts experts, right? I'm surrounded by people who can tell you everything you need to know about the arts system in Houston and the world. Um, but what I don't have here is an emergency manager. I don't have an, a, a disaster expert here at the table to help us figure out the answers. So we did a national search um, to hire a consultant to do the actual research. And I think that's one of the best decisions that we made, right? We looked at the table and we said, this is what we are the expert in, but we need an expert in this other thing to come in and help us answer these questions. So we hired a man named Gary Friedel um, from Modern Public Safety, LLC. He was a, I guess he still is, a former fire chief from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, great guy, came down, spent a year with us. We did, um, uh, so I'm not a researcher, so my language will not be as clean as Leah's language. Um, so uh, I apologize for that as we go through this. Um, we did um, focus groups. We did individual individual interviews. Um, Gary traveled across the United States to interview people about their experiences in disaster and how they recovered. Um, but before we get into all of that, what became clear within days of Gary beginning his research in 2019 was that that there was no way 
for the arts and cultural system to talk to the emergency management system. There was no way for us as a as an industry to say this is what we need, this is where we need help. And there was no way for the emergency management system to say how how can we help you? So the very first thing that we did before the research study even slightly came together um, was we created what we call the disaster services program at the Houston Arts Alliance, because we know that the way to um, people what they say in the emergency management field is people don't um, don't uh, give a, give each other business cards during a disaster, right? You don't trade business cards in a disaster. You have to make all of those relationships in advance so that when a disaster happens, they have my phone number, they have my email address, they call me and we have a way to talk to each other. Um, so that was the biggest piece of research that we found. And that was just anecdotal. It was just from like interviewing like three emergency managers and like, you know, what we already knew about Harvey. Um, Yes, so that's how it sort of transformed into the program. What we also learned um, through that time, the thing that that just like lives in my head rent free, the quote that lives in my head rent free all the time is, I wanted help, but I didn't know where to go. I needed help, but I didn't know where to go. And um, it just breaks my heart. Um, and so we set out as a result of that, um, uh, we set out as a result of that to be the place that you could go when a disaster happens. So that meant that we were just collecting information, making relationships, being able to answer that question. The the third thing that was really important about the research is we don't we don't focus on preparedness at HAA. Preparedness is not um, a priority because preparedness takes changing people's minds, right? And Leah can talk about this, you know, for days, which I uh, can't. Um, so our research and the results of our research really focuses on on response and recovery on the system itself, not on the changes that you can make as an organization, but on how we as a system can be better prepared and better connected to the system that already exists, um, which is its own sort of problem and um, solution. Right. Um, and then the study has 35 um, problems and solutions to those problems. Um, many of them are, you know, you need someone who talks directly to the emergency management system. Um, some of them are, uh, my favorite one is, uh, we have to begin recovering immediately. You know, in the arts and uh, culture system, we, we have this idea that like, oh, we're not the most hurt, right? And when you have a big disaster, we're not the most hurt. So we need to step back and allow those who are without um, homes or without food or whatever, um, let them go first. Right. Um, but the truth is that those organizations like the Alley Theater in Houston, who immediately got out there and were like, I have millions of dollars worth of damage, millions of dollars worth of damage and we need your help. Those people who stayed connected to their constituents, who stayed connected to their donors, those are the people who recovered best. Right. And and business continuity is such an important part of preparedness planning and also response and recovery um, and something that we often overlook, right? So we can talk about, we talk a lot about training our ushers to um, get people to the tornado shelter, right? But do we talk a lot about, you know, when do people come back to work? Or how do we let our patrons know how much damage our building has? Um, and those are some great things that came out of our report. Did I skip anything? That's everything, I think. Would you um, would you talk a little bit about the outcomes of the report um, in the way of the differences you have seen it make in guiding the work of the Arts Alliance itself or in the lives of artists and uh, those that the Alliance works with, especially in those relationships that you might have built uh, that you didn't have before, like you touched on about emergency management. Yeah, so we were lucky in that we had two or three emergency managers from around um, the city be on our advisory board, our steering committee for the research, which ended up being 21 people. Um, and those, those um, emergency managers, this is where I think the act of research is really powerful, right? So sometimes we talk only about the outcomes of research, but I think we also need to talk about the, the act of research itself, right? So in our research, it was very people-based, it was very conversational, it was very story-based. And, and 
every month these 21 people came together and we talked about disasters and these emergency managers learned firsthand from individual artists from cultural districts from larger arts organizations small arts organizations what happened to them during harvey where the gaps were they heard the stories and they were able to say back to them well that's that's because of this or this is because of that but they also learned that these are people and how many people were affected and they became emotionally invested in the arts industry of Houston. So as a result of that, um, uh, I maintained a relationship with these emergency managers and when the freeze came um, in 2021, um, I was called by the Harris, wait, I have to say this correctly because they get mad if I say it wrong. The Harris County Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, um, they called me uh, and asked me to run what's called the Natural and Cultural Resources Recovery for, the, for Harris County. And what that meant was that we, for the first time, had a cultural person at the table as the county was talking about what's wrong, how do we recover, what needs to be done. So I was able to sit at the table and I was able to not only learn and share with artists and arts organizations the resources that were available, right? So I was able to then tell the people at HAA, um, here's where the food banks are, or here's where you can go to warm up, or here's, um, you know, how you can access um, uh, like power money or rent money or whatever. Um, but in addition to that, I was able to report back to them, this is how much damage we have. You know, uh, we, we found um, as a result of me being there, <laughs> there was a library um, in uh, Far East Harris County that uh, not incorporated in the city of Houston, um, and they were reporting the damage of the, the library. It had a, a pipe burst and water everywhere, and they were saying, oh, it's like, I'm making these numbers up because I don't have them in front of me, but they were like, oh, it's like $2 million worth of damage. And I said, oh, so you didn't get very many books wet. And they said, no, that's the damage to the building. And I said, well, what's the damage to the collection? And they said, the damage to the collection? And I said, the, yes, how many books are ruined? You need to put that in the numbers, right? And so that number became inflated significantly because they hadn't thought like, oh, we're gonna have to replace the cost of these books as well. Um, and so it just helps change the sort of way that emergency managers think. As a result of that, so in the, I don't want to get too technical, right, because I don't want to be too boring, but in the emergency management system, you know, they define a cultural asset as a physical thing. So they, uh, it's really defined by, um, it, uh, it's defined by like historical artifacts or like pieces of art or um, an actual museum, right? Those are the ways that they define like what a cultural asset was. And what I was able to do and what we're able to do at what they're able to do at Houston Arts Alliance is, is look at them and say like, well, is the artist not a cultural asset? Like the knowledge that the artist has, is that not a cultural asset? Is the dance studio that your kids go to every weekend not a small business and a cultural asset? Like, shouldn't those be included in the planning that we're doing? Um, you know, is the mural on the side of the bank not a cultural asset that makes our city beautiful, right? Like, makes it what it is. And so we're able, we were able very slowly to change the definition of how Harris County looks at cultural asset from this very, um, what I would say square thing into a more sort of amorphous um, uh, thing. Um, we also uh, were able to create and have, not uh, they have, sorry, tense is hard for me with we and they and us. And um, I left HAA three weeks ago, so it's all sort of um, uh, still changing. Um, uh, they now have a long standing uh, $65,000 that lives in the bank all the time for an arts um, emergency relief fund, right? Because we know that immediately after a disaster, all artists really want is money, right? Because um, they need to figure out how to clean their stuff and they need to figure out how to get new stuff and they, they've lost all of their income. What we saw in the, um, in the fire that happened in December at this artist studio is that they completely lost their way to make any money whatsoever. This was their studios were their galleries. It was where they made art. It was where they sold art. It was all of that. And so in addition to having to clean their whole collection, they also had to figure out how to have income in it in, as well, right? And so just being able to say to them immediately, right? Like here is a thousand dollars. There is nothing like, there are no obligations to you for this. You don't have to report back to us, pay your rent, feed your kids, buy art supplies, whatever you want, but here it is, um, helps them feel a lot more secure and a lot more hopeful, which then helps them 
you know, res respond and recover to, to what's going on. Um, at HAA, we very firmly believe that preparedness is important, but that you can never be all the way prepared, right? Because you're always preparing for the previous disaster. In Houston, like, uh, we could go on for days about how to prepare for a hurricane. I got six gallons of water in my house all the time, right? <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, we know that we know to have canned food, but what we're not prepared for is a fire. And we weren't, you know, what we weren't prepared for a freeze. Like none of us had any idea what to do when a freeze happened. Um, and so while some of that is overlap, right? Preparedness is important, but it's also important for the system to be able to respond and to help people in these universal ways. I'm going to ask you one more follow-up question. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about COVID and uh, how that was managed? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in co so our research study started on in March of 2019. Um, it was due to be completed in March of 2020. I think you can hear where maybe that went awry. Um, <laughs> so in March of 2020, um, the Houston rodeo shut down due to COVID and then the city of Houston shut down um, due to COVID-19. And our project wasn't done. We didn't have uh, the roadmap, the guide that we have today. What I like to say is we had, um, uh, we had a blueprint and we had put up the frame of the house um, and it started raining and we were just like, just come in, just come in the house. And we threw the blue tarp over and then we were like, hey, do you know plumbing? Can you work on the kitchen? Oh, hey, do you know electricity? Right, we, we were putting the house together as we were helping people. And what that means is that the power of community and the power of the group is has really guided the way that we respond to things. So during COVID, we had about 20 organizations that came together, much like they did during Harvey. And we said, okay, who can do what, right? Like, okay, so, you know, you Fresh Arts, which is an organization in Houston, you're an, a, 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 an individual artist fo focused organization. Like, can you be in charge of working with Surf Plus to like get information out to them? Um, and we did a couple of things. We had a research study that we put together where we figured out what the needs were for the community, both for arts organizations and for individuals. We put out that needs assessment. Um, uh, and then in addition to that, we what we heard over and over again, again, I think a lot of it is listening, right? You just have to listen to what people are saying. What we heard over and over again was, I miss being able to talk to people. I miss being able to work with my community. So we created what we called the town hall, which was just a monthly uh, Zoom that we opened. And we said, y'all come in, we'll put you in small groups. You can talk about whatever you want. Um, and that was the most successful program that we had for all of COVID. Um, we gave away you know, $600 um, to individual artists that applied. We did a, a lot of things, but the most important thing we did was we kept our community connected. Um, because that's what they asked for. And like Leah said, you know, people know what they need after a disaster, you just have to listen. And while we wanted to be like, oh, here's the marketing that you need to do, or here's how you turn digital, or here's, you know, here's the way that you clean your space, all they wanted was to talk to each other. And so that's what we provided. That is really fascinating. Those are great examples, every single one. Thank you for sharing those with us. And uh, Leah Lauren has given us so many great examples of research and anecdotal information that um, are helping make the case for advancing support for the arts when it comes to preparedness, emergencies, disasters, response. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about other research that exists around emergencies and disasters? Sure. I'm going to share my screen real quick and skip um, to this page. Let's see if it goes straight there. Yeah. Um, you know, Lauren made a really great point. I think um, in the past decade, we the research that, that does exist for us to look at was focused on preparedness. And I think we are starting to see a shift now um, to, to you know, we, we, yes, okay, a lack of preparedness exists, but you cannot be prepared to ever, for every possible uh, scenario of a disaster. And also we, we know now because of this existing research about preparedness, sort of why, and I'll, I'll talk um, 
just briefly about this, you'll see, and I, I saw that Mary Eileen is on um, the call today um, from New Jersey, um, and I know that the state of New Jersey has done some great um, survey work and research in areas around preparedness, but here's some of the isolated studies um, that have taken place in the past decade around readiness, and when I say readiness, I'm, I'm talking about mainly pre preparedness, and you can see here, I just pulled some quotes um, regarding this lack of preparedness and, and the findings are there. You know, a majority of arts organizations, a majority of artists are not prepared. The ones that are, there are still gaps in preparedness plans regarding communications, um, you know, inventory, uh, business continuity plans. I'll leave that up just for a few minutes or not a few minutes, but for a few more seconds if people want to read that. Um, and then for me, what I what I think is, is interesting is I've been looking at the preparedness surveys and research that's out there. Um, the, the reasons why there, there are some themes that emerge, and I going back to why research is important in this area is to kind of look at these themes and, and pull them out and call them for what they are. And so, I sort of pulled together this, um, this model here of there's this theme of lack of time, lack of knowledge, and lack of resources. And it all leads to, I use apathy very lightly. I know what it's like also to run a nonprofit arts agency. I say apathy only because there's, it's not that you don't care or a person doesn't care about readiness. It's that there's sort of this lack of prioritization or lack of interest lack of enthusiasm around the topic. And so that all of these issues of lack of time, knowledge, and resources lead to this deeper issue of, of apathy towards the topic. Um, and then going towards more of what, of what Lauren was talking about, about focusing, it's like, okay, well, we're never going to be fully prepared. Let's, let's talk about, um, let's look at response and recovery. What, what are these support systems that are out there that exist or that need to exist to support artists and arts organizations in times of need, because that's what we, where we're really, we want to put our efforts. Um, just finding now that arts organizations are unprepared or artists are unprepared is not particularly helpful. And um, there's a, um, a document out there called the Cultural Placekeeping Guide, which um, I, I mentioned here, and I will provide the link if I didn't send that to you, Emily, for those of you that might be interested in it. But it even highlights, okay, yes, arts organizations, there's a lack of preparedness. Let's focus on response and recovery and ways that we can respond better as an arts community. Um, so there, there are some studies that exist. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share here. And I mentioned this to Emily too, there's a great list of resources um, with these studies and links to these studies through the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness Emergency Response, if you're interested. There's some great findings from all of these reports that I think can, you can take from it what you think might be important to your own arts community. Um, and the work that you do. And I think the growing consensus is now, how do we connect uh, the arts community to the emergency management community? Um, how can we learn from each other? How can we talk to each other? And there is a lot of great work going on right now um, to, to try to address that. Um, so those are a few of the studies that do exist. And um, I think here in a little bit, we'll talk more about the Kentucky um, Arts Disaster Case Study too. We can talk more about that. You know, one of my favorite topics because I've talked with both of you quite a bit is, um, is the gaps that exist in, in services. So when we talk about research and data and other resources in this area, especially in relation to emergency management, which you've now both talked about extensively, do you have any thoughts on where research, research or resources are missing the mark or totally lacking in the field? And that's a question for both of you, whoever would like to share first. Uh, 
Um, oh no, yeah, we both Lauren. unmuted at the same time. Yeah, I know. Lauren, Lauren, let's that. start with you. <laughs> um, I was going to say that there's two major places I think where research and and um, uh, resources are, are really missing, right? One I sort of touched on earlier, which is the way that emergency management defines cultural asset. Um, and we need to help them either through research or anecdotal studies or whatever, help them sort of broaden that definition um, so that we can help more of our people. I'm happy to go more in depth in that um, another time, but I feel like I've, I've covered that as much as it needs to be covered. Um, the the other part is that what I have learned, so I am a, uh, I didn't share this in the beginning, I have a bachelor's degree in theater and a master's degree in arts administration. I am an arts administrator. Um, but when I took on this position, I trained myself in emergency management, I went to FEMA classes. And so um, I, I, I can bridge the gap. But the two industries speak completely different languages, right? I consider myself a translator, right? So when I say response and recovery, I'm speaking about like a very specific time in the in the disaster cycle. I'm using the emergency management terms, whereas um, in the arts community, we use them more broadly, right? Response and recovery. Um, and so I think like one of the next steps I think for research or some sort of project that needs to be done is, um, I hate to say it, like a like a dictionary that sort of helps us understand both sides, right? Um, I think um, what our report has is uh, it's 80 pages. You don't have to read the whole thing, um, just read the, the solutions, but it has uh, an explanation of the emergency management system and then an explanation of the arts and cultural system and the emergency management system explanation is one page long. It's one page it's very cut and dry, this is the way the system works and the arts and cultural system is like five pages long right we're complicated and if we can't learn how to talk about ourselves to the the emergency management system, then they don't know where to start right. And so I think um, we have to start learning how to talk to them and changing our language um, to help them understand what we're saying. Um, and I think that research is, is, is needed. Thanks. And Leah? Yeah, that's, those are great points. And I, I remember reading in the Houston um, report too, Lauren, that because of um, advocacy work based on research, you know, governmental organizations have been changing how they identify what is part of the arts sector. Therefore, they are able to offer more of their support. So we can see how things are changing um, over time to allow these, the government agencies to go, oh, okay, um, yeah, public art mural, murals, that needs to be included. Um, art centers, they need to be included. Um, so I, I think that, again, is just another, um, I, I don't know, cheerleading moment to say, you know, this, this research that turns into advocacy in the arts can help change policies at a, at a larger, more governmental level so that we can see more support. Um, another area that I think is lacking is looking at uh, mental health and, and social psychological approaches to disasters. Um, in, in the arts sector in particular, we are creative beings, we're empathetic beings, we, we, we feel the world, we carry the world on our shoulder often. Um, and I think it is, it, for me, it's really interesting to start looking at, okay, if there is a lack of preparedness, if we're having issues um, responding to recovery um, due to social behaviors due to mental health issues, what can we do? And um, sort of breaking through some of these cycles is just ourselves understanding why we may consider certain risks to be important and certain risks to be not important. And as arts managers, why do we choose certain risks to manage and why do we choose certain risks not to manage? Um, and some of that just takes a little bit of knowing about ourselves um, because our beliefs and our traditions, our experiences, it all shapes um, how we make decisions about disaster risks and whether they're important or not. Um, so there are some that I thought I would just mention. There's um, this, uh, the availability bias that um, social psychological researchers, they've, they've known about for decades now, which is that essentially a person makes decisions based on the most convenient or comfortable memory. So this is why we, we, we see a lot of funding and a lot of support immediately after a disaster occurs, because it's 
it's, it's there in our memory, we can retrieve it more quickly. And then over time, we may see preparedness levels, support levels decline. Um, another aspect of the availability bias is that we are slow to look at particular instances from a general truth, but we're really quick to infer a general truth about like a specific instance. And what I mean by that is why we choose to fear certain risks over others, even when data may say, okay, that's not rational. We feel unsafe. Um, as it's summer. So I'm, I'm right now I'm going to like swimming in the ocean, like the fear of shark attacks when we know like, okay, the data says actually bee stings are way more of a, of a threat to human beings than, than shark attacks. Okay. But we may feel more um, afraid of shark attacks. Okay. Because of that, those stories that we hear in, in the media or um, that we read in books. Okay. Um, and then there's also this a uh, social phenomenon, social psychology phenomenon called the probability neglect, where really powerful narratives are more compelling than statistics. Um, and this goes back to why we need more stories uh, in our research, particularly in the arts. Um, and But this might help explain why someone might fear a storm as a high risk for an outdoor event. And then maybe due to recent media reports or a recent storm that's occurred. But accor according to um, more disaster report data in the United States and globally, heat waves are actually causing a larger threat to human life than storms. Um, and, and knowing these things about ourselves and how we process stories, how we process data, um, why we might feel biased towards one thing or another, I think taking time to understand that also can help us um, in the arts think about ways of being more ready um, for the potential disaster um, or emergency that may occur. So all that to say, I think also looking at social um, psychological aspects and research is lacking as, as well as mental health. Those are all very interesting. Tell me, tell me too, in a follow-up, we've talked about data, uh, a lot in research, but what other types of resources do you think are essential to garner more support for um, the field it, following disasters and emergencies that, that affect the arts? What kind of resources do you think are missing or need to even be bolstered? They're there to some degree, but need more support. Uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to address the 100 pound elephant in the room. Um, which is funding. So what we found um, at, at HAA is that um, we have to define the work that we're doing in a way that gets in the way of asking for funding, right? Um, we've been lucky that there are a couple of, of foundations who believe in us, who uh, have listened to me yammer at them enough that they um, <laughs> that they are supporting us. But generally, we it's very difficult for us to find funding um, to do this sort of preparedness work on a systemic level. Uh, um, and I think that we need to figure out as national funders, as local funders, as state funders, like how we're going to start giving money to these um, systems to, to start uh, being able to respond and recover, um, or even to the organizations, right? So Surf Plus has this great program, right, where they give out money to artists and they say, like, use this to get prepared, like prepare your studio by um, you know, fire extinguishers. Like, why can't we come up with something like that um, for our organizations or on a national level um, for our local arts or agencies? So that's, I think, a, a big problem. Uh, is that, Lauren, is that why um, the Arts Alliance keeps that fund of the $65,000? Is that part of the reason why, why that exists, to be able to respond to needs immediately? Yeah, yeah. If we didn't have, it's it's kind of like an endowment, right? If we didn't, we will fundraise when a disaster happens, but we have that money there so we can immediately give it out. Um, but that that doesn't cover the program, right? That's just in response to a disaster. And I cost money, right? We have two people, the HAA has two people on staff. The, the program isn't that large. It's not robust. It isn't expensive, but we still have to pay salaries and we still have to, you know, pay for lunch with emergency managers so that they'll talk to me. Um, and, and finding that kind of support to do that work is, is 
increasingly difficult as we get further away from a disaster. Um, but the further away we get from a disaster, the more likely it is that we have one. You know, in Harris County, we have a, nat a nationally declared disaster on average every nine months. And so we're lucky that way that it's it's hard to get away from disaster, but um, it still we still need the the people to help us continue to do this work. Leah, thoughts on that, especially on funding? Sure. Well, I was I was going to mention that um, the preliminary results from the survey of artists and arts organizations in affected counties in Kentucky have certainly hit home the importance of cash um, and the need of rebuilding inventory and replacing physical damage to facilities and equipment. So um, I, I also wanted to mention something that's not cash related that I think um, can be helpful. And um, there's a link to, uh, to the, the university's arts extension service. Um, they work in 120 counties throughout Kentucky. And since the disasters, they have been putting out um, guides, handouts, small, um, just brief resource sheets that are very specific to different areas, whether it's um, you know, storage and, and recovery um, methods of, of recovering um, damage storage to mental health um, in recovery. Um, and um, yeah, I see you posted the link there. I think we could see um, more support like this through other um, extension services that work in more rural areas. Uh, I know in Kentucky, the arts extension has eight full-time regional agents throughout the state and producing more documents like this um, where you have built-in relationships with local people, these regional agents and having these kinds of resources that you can either get tangibly in hand or you can go to the website to find, I think um, are really great resources outside of cash. I mean, obviously that is um, a big one. And I'd also want to point out like, you know, in the immediate aftermath, just hands on deck, you know, help with cleanup. I'm still, I'm still seeing a lot of feedback. Like I still need help with cleanup, you know, months after the disaster has occurred. So, so some of it is, is more physical labor too. I would like to add to that. Um that there has to be some sort of organization, right? There are lots of people who want to help, but you can't just throw them and say, you know, help people. There has to be some way for that organization to happen. Um, and that's a resource that's missing, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in terms of, you know, what exists there, the Alliance for Response that typically has focused on the cultural sector is now also starting to include the arts. And this is, um, a national organization that helps build um, networks for support. You know, it connects emergency management and the arts uh, and cultural sectors together, but it's also about forming community networks um, that can be enacted in, in a response in a in recovery situation. And I think that's something that's been also found from a lot of this research is that, you know, pulling from existing contacts keeping these networks alive, knowing who to call if you have damaged books. Who do you call? Um, knowing who to call if you need a business continuity plan because um, you don't have one. Um, these are having these, just this communication list of, of a network um, uh, can really help in, in the disaster recovery and response. I don't know if we went off of your question. Sorry. I mean, no, no, that's fine. It's, it's great. Uh, you know, as experts in the field, obviously some of the things we've been talking about uh, and we know we need to advance these conversations and elevate them um, so that they, they can attract the resources that they need. So preparedness, response, recovery, other issues. Um, the, meeting the direct needs of artists and organizations, the, the needs of our sector. Um, so what do you think we need to do or, um, again, what is necessary to elevate those conversations, to make that more of a regular conversation at the local or the state or the national level? And I think we all agree it needs to be addressed at the national level. So however you'd like to respond. 
I mean, I think conversations like this are really important where we're being very honest about what's needed and, and the, the barriers that we've come across. Um, uh, and I appreciate Kentucky for putting this together and for you to putting for you putting for you putting this together. Um, but I think also, you know, we were talking about coalitions a moment ago and coalitions of people that come together to respond, but we need coalitions of, of advocacy, right? Um, you know, if um, if all of the local arts agencies in Texas got together and started yelling, not yelling, but, you know, advocating to the state, um, you know, that's more powerful than just the voice of Houston. If all of the state agencies got together and started talking to FEMA, that's more powerful than just one. And I think we need to be finding um, the community and the coalitions within ourselves um, to get that voice out there. I also think people need to be more vocal about what they're doing, right? So I can't find this research. I know it exists. I'm, I'm looking for it, but I know there's three things that have to happen in order for people to take action, right? They have to hear about it a lot. They have to hear about it from a lot of different sources, and then they have to see people that they trust and respect making those choices. And so I think if we, as organizations that are making these choices, become much more uh, loud about the choices and the actions that we're taking, I think it's going to help other people make those ch changes as well and advocate on a national level. Leah, what would you like to add? Oh, that was very well said, 100%, very well said. Um, and I, I think um, on, on my end, on the research end, I have a dream of a disaster research center for the arts. Um, and I keep putting this out there to the world. See, it's kind of what you're saying, but just keep saying it. And, uh, or maybe if you just, created um, go on GoDaddy and get a website that says Disaster Research Center for the Arts. And it exists all of a sudden, but um, no, it's gonna take a lot more planning than that. But I, I do think that this would be really helpful in studying risk, vulnerabilities in the arts sector, the effects of emergencies and disasters. Um, and it could be a space for concept development, for, for people who are interested in this topic, for arts practicing arts managers, practicing artists. Um, and, and then helpful to understand the potential risks that are out there for, um, for artists and arts organizations. So um, I think you're right. Advocacy um, is key here and groups of people that believe in this and can coalesce and just, we, could, we just need to do more of this, just more talking. And I know in Kentucky, there's a network coming together. And so, yeah. yeah. Leah, I think you're selling yourself short though too. I think one of the things that you and I have talked about is how much you want other sort of masters arts administration programs to have the kind of education that you have as well, that you have in your program. And I think doing that will help raise awareness and start changing the mind of the field as well. Absolutely, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, it is a real gap right now um, that we have so many more trained arts managers through these programs. And yet there's only one program right now in the nation that focuses on this as a topic, so. Which blows my mind. There's, uh, that's the thing when we've been looking into some of these things, we find there's only one um, in several instances. And Lauren, I know you and I have talked that, that you were only one in your position, you know, that that's the only, or the only one we know of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that existed what you did uh, when you were at the Arts Alliance, and which is remarkable, um, considering, or especially when we think of those big disasters that have been all over the news for years and years and years and years now. Um, and I wonder why that is. Any thoughts on why that might be? I'm really kind of going off script here. <laughs> Does it's anybody not have a thought on that? Well, it's not sexy. And it goes back to what Leah was saying, which is, you know, um, it, it's what's the easiest psychological thing, right? Um, it, it's not sexy to say like, what I do all day or what I did all day was talk to emergency managers about all the things that are going to go wrong. It's also emotionally draining to have that on your brain all the time. And so, you know, if we're going to start having more people who do what I did and what the Arts Alliance continues to do. I want to be clear that my position is not gone. Someone else is now doing it at the Houston Arts Alliance. It's just not me anymore. Um, uh, but if we're going to continue to have people doing that, um, that we have to acknowledge that it's not sexy, right? And, and that um, it's going to be hard. 
um, to fundraise for and to do all the other things. I've completely lost my train of thought. I apologize. No, no you're, you're right right on. On. <laughs> And I would say too, I, I think that that's a great um, reflection on the Arts Alliance that, you know, when a person leaves a position, you can cut the position uh, and redirect funds elsewhere. But it's uh, obvious that it's a commitment made uh, by the Arts Alliance to artists and organizations, and which is tremendous. I mean, to see that, tremendous. So kudos to the, the Arts Alliance. Yeah. And I wanted to, to throw out there real quick, um, you know, that there is there is talk about tying grant funding to showing you that you have business continuity plan or arts emergency plans um, in order to get funding. I know that discussion is out there. And, and part of it is like, how do we really motivate people to prioritize this non-sexy thing? And um, a lot of it's like, you know, strategic planning, like 20 years ago. Well, if you start to have to submit a strategic plan, or in this case, submit a disaster plan in order to get funding, that is certainly one way of doing it. But I always you know, say, okay, that's one thing, but you have to be able to provide the resources in addition to making that requirement. Um, because now you're asking arts managers to do yet one more thing. You're asking artists to do yet one more thing. And I should say also just on the side that I do know that the Performing Arts Readiness Project and the National Coalition uh, for Arts Preparedness have been trying to also do classes where they come in and teach short lecture series for different arts um, administration programs around the country. Um, so when I said the only, I meant to say the only like full semester course. So there are some, like if anybody on this call, you know, runs an arts management program or knows somebody who does, there are resources if you can't do a full semester course to bring in people to come, you know, talk about it as part of an existing course too. So that's a great point. Okay, I'm going to um, switch back to something I wanted to talk a, a little bit about that's Kentucky specific. Um, Leah, I wanted to ask you if you would share with our folks about our ongoing case study about disasters and emergencies in the arts uh, that looks at events that occurred around the West Kentucky tornadoes and the Eastern Kentucky floods. Um, if you could share a little bit of, about what you found so far and kind of where we are in that study, because it is ongoing. Absolutely. And let me, um, oh no, what did I just do? That's not what I wanted to show everybody. I was going to share an information sheet. Um, if you have that link, Emily, because my screen share is doing something very crazy right now. Um, I have it. Thank you. Just in case. Um, and since I can't get my screen share to work, apologies. And I know we're running a little short on time. Um, the, the study is essentially looking at trying to find some actual numbers, but also trying to get stories. Um, we launched the, an online survey in April um, to the affected counties and how we defined the affected counties was what counties were um, had the federal disaster declaration. And in this info sheet, you'll see maps there of which counties are included. Um, so the online survey is actually still open because what we are seeing is that there keeps trickling in. So if you have filled out the survey, thank you. It's confidential. We did that on purpose so that people felt comfortable sharing um, their stories, but also there's an opportunity if you want to be involved further to share your contact information. Um, and we so far um, have had 54 responses. And I know that that, I mean, getting people to fill out surveys is really hard. Getting people to fill out surveys about something that is traumatic in their lives is even harder. So in addition to the surveys, we are doing um, interviews and I have 50 interviewees. People have said they want to be interviewed. Others um, that I have found through stories or Emily has said, you need to talk to them. Um, and also talking to governmental agencies um, through FEMA. Um, and, and doing interviews that way. Um, and then in late July and possibly early August at this point, we're gonna be doing focus groups, um, trying to find some central locations. We're nailing down all of the specific spaces and the dates and times, and we will share those um, here in actually just a couple of weeks. And the focus groups are also designed to fill in the gaps from the survey 
um, to get more stories from those that were affected or those that were working with those um, affected during the storm. So um, things are going well. They're going, uh, you know, it's again, the surveys um, are showing some of the more immediate needs. Um, and I think what's interesting is from the artists and it's, I need help with cleanup. I need physical help. And then for arts organizations, it's, I need cash. Um, so there are differences, um, of course, from sole employee business or people that practice their art, but don't see themselves as a business to arts organizations and their needs. So I think we'll, we'll see an interesting balance from the findings in that. And also we're seeing, you know, that there are various reasons people didn't apply for support, um, lack of trust um, in governmental agencies, confusion, um, wondering because of COVID um, if you can apply because you already applied for assistance. Um, and there's just so much going on in the immediate aftermath that it's hard to focus on that. So um, uh, I think in terms of continuing needs, we're seeing overwhelmingly from the survey response that it's disaster assistance support specifically for the arts. Um, individuals are wanting to know more information um, about disaster assistance specifically for the arts. So that is a real call to, I think, agencies that are supporting artists and arts organizations about the work that needs to be done um, there. So that's some of the preliminary, preliminary findings. Um, and I, the report ideally will be out in the fall, um, hoping that we can get all these focus groups all wrapped up and the interviews at the end of the summer. Great. We're looking forward to it. Thank you so much. So we've got about five minutes left and, um, I want to talk just for a few minutes about recommendations. So, um, we know there are recommendations in reports. Uh, your own recommendations, which um, Lauren, I loved that you talked about a dictionary of terms to bridge some of those gaps earlier. I think that's fantastic. Um, so what other practical and achievable recommendations have you seen or have you developed on your own? Uh, or they may be in reports that artist organizations or administrators could implement or begin implementing. I like to see for myself, I like to see set a short term goal um, so that I can achieve something, you know, quickly, uh, which motivates to move beyond. So um, what are some things that uh, we could implement or begin right now to increase our knowledge about emergencies and disasters or our preparedness? Uh, can you share some thoughts on, the, on that? I mean, I think the easiest thing to do um, like on a state or local level is find your local alliance for response. Just find them and reach out to them and get to know them. We have in Texas the Texas Cultural Emergency Resource Alliance. There are other ones across the state, across the United States. Just figure out who they are, reach out, meet the president and say like, okay, so now I know who to call when something happens. Like, I think that's the easiest thing you can do. The other thing I say uh, for artists <laughs> is if you do nothing else, if you learn nothing else from this conversation, just take a picture of everything you own. Just go go to your studio and take a picture of all of your art supplies so that when something, if something does happen, you have an inventory. You don't even have to write it down. Just take a picture, right? Um, I think that's another just like easy, easy thing you can do. Those are great points and I think Adding to it, what I've experienced um, myself and then what I've seen from others is that after a disaster, maintaining the connections you made, um, again, based on some of the, the social um, psychological things we know about how we kind of move on. And, and some, some of that is just for survival. We have to move on. We have to keep, um, we have to keep operating, living, doing, doing our work being with our family and um, and living. So we do need to move on, but I think maintaining contacts, those that you worked with in the immediate aftermath, keep them, um, keep them close. And because you may need them again or having, you know, reaching out and, and talking can also help with recovery. Um, so, and these are people that you, you shared um, traumatic experiences with and sometimes talking about them. Sometimes for some people, it can be really, um, helpful. But um, the the other other aspect is there are resources out there for creating disaster plans, emergency plans. And um, I'll give a shout out for the D plan, which is 
the, the national resource. Um, it's either low cost or free um, because they are giving out free scholarships for it now, but it is designed to be um, specific to your arts organization, uh, no matter your size, no matter where you are located. Um, and Emily, if I didn't get that link to you, I can post it on the chat. I don't know if I sent that one to you, but no, the, I don't have that one. The D plan is designed to try to be very accessible to create um, emergency plans for um, arts organizations. So I'll, I'll get that. And yeah, another note about the D plan is there is a free version of D plan um, that if you're kind of just starting, it's a, it's a great place to start. You can check it out. And then the paid version which I believe is around $59 a year um, is much more extensive. Um, and then there's an opportunity right now to apply for D plan and have it paid for through the National Coalition of Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response and I believe Performing Arts Readiness. Um, so that exists uh, if you wanna check that out. And um, Leah just dropped that information in the chat. Uh, we've, uh, we're near the end of our time together. I wanna offer our experts a final opportunity to share some um, closing thoughts, uh, especially on where you think we need to go as a field in, in this, uh, in, around these topics. I think um, I wanna say, I I know this can feel overwhelming, right? It's a lot and it's terrifying. And um, I know that if you've been through a disaster before, it can be triggering. I, you know, I, um, I, I like to share this that, you know, during Hurricane Harvey, we used a car on the street outside of our apartment as a, as an, a guy gauge of like how high the water was. And we were so excited when we could see the, the side view mirrors, right? Like, I know how hard it is. Um, but you don't have to do all of the things that we talked about, right? You just do one thing today and then do what feels good. The other thing is that there, that I am available, right? If, if somebody has more questions, if you wanna learn more, I know Leah is available. I assume, I don't wanna speak for her. If you have questions, if you wanna learn more, there are experts that are happy to help you through, happy to talk to you about things and you're not alone, right? Like it can feel very isolating when you start thinking about how terrible things could be. Um, but just know that there are people like Leah, there are people like me who are here to help you figure out that system. And I'll put my email in the chat as well. That's great. I'm yeah, and I, I am certainly available. So that's all right that you mentioned that, Lori. Thank you. Um, especially since this is a Kentucky Arts Council hosted event. Um, I'm assuming that there are, and I know I can see some familiar names, um, many Kentucky artists and arts organizations represented. And um, I, I hope that you do feel comfortable reaching out um, if you have questions, concerns, or you wanna share your story um, for the, the research that I'm currently doing in the state, so. Thank you. Okay, this has been a wonderful time together and I want to thank you both for being here. It is so meaningful. Um, I have been looking forward to this conversation for some time and it's just been wonderful. So thank you so much for all of the information and the knowledge that you've shared with everyone today. Just so everybody here knows, um, you will receive a link to this conversation um, on our YouTube channel, probably within the next week. And also, um, if you want to see it immediately again or pull information from it, you can find it on our Facebook page um, where it should be available in just a few moments after we end. So again, thank you so much. Our next session is, um, Tom Musgrave dropped it in the chat. It's at 11 a.m. on July 26th, and um, the theme for that is Disaster Declared, Resources for Arts and Cultural Institutions After Large-Scale Disaster Events. And we'll be joined by Lori Foley with the Heritage Emergency National Task Force, and also Elena Gregg with um, the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation in the National Heritage Responders. So that'll also be a great conversation. Uh, thank you so much for attending today. We really appreciate you and I hope you have a great rest of your day.